Keep yourself in the loop of everything football on the Golden State Media Concepts Football Podcast. The latest news on and off the field, be it college football, Big Ten, SCC, Big 12, Pac-12, ACC to the NFL. We've got you covered. Listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Football Podcast. GSMC Football Podcast. We're listening here on the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host Bryce Lewis, and you know, you know what it is. It's it's Championship Sunday coming up in the NFL. As we're going to talk about the two championship games in the AFC and 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 in the NFC, we're also going to get into a list that Bleacher Report brought out about big name players who could be cut. My thoughts on that. Also, we're going to get into some news and notes around the league. A couple of su- surprising retirings. And also, we're going to talk about the college football playoff fallout from 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 one of the the great days in, in, in Louisiana history in Louisiana. But like I said, we're going to talk about the championship games, and we're going to start with the AFC side. So, obviously, this is a game of two teams that are very. You could maybe say you didn't think one of these teams would be here, which is the Tennessee Titans. Well, obviously, the Chiefs, they had Super Bowl aspirations. They got an defensive coordinator. They're trying to fix the defense. They're trying to get more talent around Patrick Mahomes and just be able to produce and be able to get him back there. Obviously, the Chiefs have had some injuries this year. Obviously, Patrick Mahomes missed a couple of games. Tyreek Hill missed some games. You know, there was a point where people were wondering if the Chiefs were going to be that good. Are they going to make it to the playoffs? I think they were 6-4 and four at one point, 5-4. and four, And then they reeled off about 7 straight Actually, it's not seven straight, six straight, plus the playoff game, seven straight, to now get to the AFC Championship game. Obviously, Patrick Mahomes, um, he is the, a lot of people may consider him the best quarterback in the NFL right now. He obviously is the most talented quarterback in the NFL right now. I would call Patrick Mahomes the James Harden of the NFL. The only difference is that, I mean, if he wins this game, then we can say he has playoff success. But I have to admit, in his first two years of starting, He's made it to the AFC Championship game. Not everybody can say they've done that. So uh, that's very that's a very big accomplishment for Patrick Mahomes on his side. Obviously, he has great weapons around him. You know, it's crazy because the, uh, the Chiefs are a very unorthodox team. They don't even have a running game, really. LaShawn McCoy is on his last legs. Their best runner is Damian Williams, but they don't even like running it, actually. So he, they usually use him in pass-catching situations, which he's superb in. And then, obviously, you have the weapons of Tyreek Hill and Travis Kelsey, all of that talent around him. It's one of the best staffs in the great supporting groups a quarterback can ever have. You know, and then they have such great receivers. Sammy Watkins, you forget about him. He was the number one receiver in Buffalo. You know, you got Miko Hardman from Georgia. Speedy, called him the human joy. I don't know, that was, they called him almost like the human joystick back at Georgia. This man runs 4-3. You've seen the plays he makes when he gets into space. He just outruns guys. You know, they had, you know, Travis Kelsey is one of the best tight ends in the game. One of the best big play tight ends in in, in, in in that case. And and defensively, they've really improved, especially since when Patrick Mahomes got back in a couple of games, their defense really improved. They've getting turnovers. They're, they're, they're a top 11 scoring defense since week 10. And they've really played some of their best football. And, you know, last week against Houston Texans, they got down 24 nothing, And they roared all the way back to win 51-31. to Not a lot of teams can do that. And that's the, and that's the thing about Houston. Houston, I mean not Houston. That's the thing about Kansas City. Kansas City, they're a team that they want to pass the ball. So even if you're up a good amount, it's never safe because it's like it's like the Patriots. You just you always have this feeling Brady's going to get them back in. And I think the Chiefs. It's not because of Brady, like like it is on the Patriots. It's 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 the offense as a whole on the Chiefs that makes you worry because all it takes is a big play here and a big play here. And then within two, three minutes, if they get a three and out, they're back. They've already crunched the lead by 14. That's how potent their offense is. That's why when they're one of the best offenses in the NFL. So, you know, coming into this matchup against uh, Tennessee, Tennessee is probably 
a, a game where you would think they should have success passing the ball. Now, mind to mention you that they played each other back in the season. I believe this is when Patrick Mahomes was just coming off his knee injury, and the Titans actually won that game by blocking a field goal in the final seconds to beat the Kansas City Chiefs. So they've played once this year, and Titans win. So you could sit here and say, well, we know the Titans can win this game. But obviously, we think the, that Kansas City team that played them then and the Kansas City team that's playing them now is different. But but it just depends on how you view it. But the key to this game is going to be really, for Kansas City defensively, you have to stop Dan, Derrick Henry. That's your biggest obstacle. He has single-handedly been one of the main, if not the main reason why, the Tennessee Titans have gotten to the AFC Championship game. 180-plus yards in two straight playoff games. <gasps> he is having a superb performance, superb performance in this playoffs. He is carrying this offense because Brian Tannehill is only averaging 80 yards a game in the playoffs. Like that's not even a hundred and they're in this because they don't even have to ask him to do that much. They can just say Derek Henry can really move us down the field. All we need you to do Tannehill is when you, when there's a big play, take it, make it. And then also when we need you to get maybe that third down, get us the third down. And then Tannehill is also mobile on the ground. Tannehill basically is doing very great situational football right now, which is complimenting Derek Henry. So if the Chiefs want to be able to win this game, they got to stop him. And then offensively, you could maybe say the weakness of the Tennessee Titans is the back end. So they have to take advantage of that. I think this is a game where obviously if Kansas City gets into the high 30s, 40s, they'll probably win this game. You know, I think they should be able to win this game because you just, you don't know in that situation on the Tennessee side of things that Ryan Tannehill is going to be able to keep up because you think Derrick Henry is going to score four or five touchdowns. I mean, we'll listen. You don't ever want to say never, but you just don't wouldn't expect that, especially if you know what the game plan is. So Tannehill's definitely going to have to take advantage of some of his his uh, mismatches or any type of uh, matchups he can get in the game. Now, talk, now I've switched over to the Tennessee Titans side. Tennessee, obviously, Derek Henry, like I said, is having a superb playoffs. He's he's dominating, and like I said, Ryan Tannehill hasn't done that much, but Ryan Tannehill has made plays when plays are there. He has made throws. That some people say he wasn't making in Miami that he's making here now. And I think that it's going to be big for, for Tannehill. Again, he probably doesn't have to have 400 yards to be Patrick Mahomes. It's not, he, with, with the running attack they have, they don't have to get into a yardage touchdown battle, but he's going to have to do what he's been doing for him the past couple of weeks. He's going to have to get some touchdowns, maybe two or three in this game to compliment Derrick Henry. If he can get two or three, that's about, that's about a good solid 30, 40 points right there. Defensively, they're going to have to get some turnovers. I, I don't think if the Titans don't get any short fields, they're going to be able to beat the Kansas City Chiefs, and that's what they've been doing all playoffs. New England, they got a turnover. In, in Ravens, they turned over Lamar Jackson three times, and, and that's what really helped them really beat the Ravens. So they're going to really be superb and make it. They're going to have to continue to play very good and solid defense and get some turnovers because that's going to really help you against a team like Kansas City and with Derrick Henry they can really shorten the game if they can get a successful running attack with Derrick Henry and move the ball that could be very superb because they can shorten the game and if the game is shortened that that's only nothing but better for the entire you know Tennessee team because now they know okay well we've shortened the game we did, we're not going to give Patrick Mahomes as many possessions as maybe he thought he was going to get in this game and also we're controlling time of possession tiring out the Kansas City Chiefs defense and you know then that's when you could take your play action big shots over to like the AJ Brown or Sterling or Smith or you know Corey Davis so it's it's it's, it's all I think in the game plan Tennessee just has to keep doing what they've been doing because that's what's gotten them here against two of the AFC's finest you beat it you beat the dynasty and you beat the potential probably MVP now you got to beat who considerably, arguably, the best quarterback and the best offense in the NFL, you know, and 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 I want to give a shout out to Mike, Coach Mike Vrabel. He has out coached, in my opinion, the last Bill Belichick and John Harbaugh, some of the best coaches in the NFL. You know, he he he, he you know he was he played on the Patriots for years. He coached under Belichick, and and he, I think he went to Tennessee, and he's just he's just makes such great coaching decisions. He's had such great game plans. And that sounds like a man who's prepared. Every team he goes into, he's prepared. He knows the right things to do. He knows what we need to do in this game to be successful. And I think that's what 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 makes him such a great leader and what makes him such a great coach for the Titans. That's why you feel like he's going to be here for years to come. He's one of the reasons why Ryan Tannehill's going to get that big contract after this year. 
I mean, you know, and he gets the most out of his guys. Clearly, Tennessee, you know, they're playing at a higher level than what they were playing in the regular season. The last two weeks, they have held the Patriots and the Ravens to 13 and 12 points. So, clearly, defensively, they're playing some of the best football of the year. And like I said, offensively, they're playing some of the best running football of the year. And if they're going to beat Kansas City, they have to keep that up because Kansas City is not going is going to score some points, I feel like, in this game. So you're going to have to get some ball control. You're going to have to score when the, when, the, when the chances and opportunities are there and make plays. But coming up next, continuing on in our championship preview, we're going to talk about the NFC's game, 49ers and Packers, right here. Are you looking for help for your fantasy football team? Check out the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Get today's best advice on who to start, who to sit, even who you should draft. From sleeper picks to red-hot lineups, they got it all covered for you. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy-football-podcast. We'll cover traditional leagues, dynasty, PPR, even IDP leagues. When you need fantasy help, there's just one show to hit up. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. GSMC Football Podcast. Last segment, we talked about the AFC Championship game. My thoughts on that game. I'll give my prediction later in, in, in the show. But I just broke down both sides and what they've done to get to this point and also what they have to do against each other for each of them to pull out the win on Sunday. And now we're going to go to the second game of, a, of the Championship Sunday. The NFC Championship game, might I say. The Packers and 49ers. Obviously, from a lineage game, this is a big lineage game because these are two of the most storied franchises in NFL history. Coming into this game, you have Jimmy Garoppolo playing his second career playoff game against a seasoned veteran, one of the best quarterback talents that a lot of people feel like have ever stepped foot in the NFL in Aaron Rodgers. And, you know, I, I feel like this game can come down to a lot of things. Now, if we're going to break it down like we did last segment, we're going to go with, we're going to talk about what the 49ers got to do. Now, the 49ers, they are one of the best teams offensively, just in all phases of the game. They can get the big play, they can beat you ground in the ball, they have, they can get you over the middle with Greg, George Kittle, ball control, high scoring, they can do it all. That's what makes them such a dangerous team, in my opinion. That's what makes them such a good team, in my opinion. They do remind me a lot of the Atlanta Falcons of 2016 when Kyle Shanahan was the off the coordinator of that team. Because it was basically almost like, it was, it was almost like the, how the team is formatted is, is kind of the same. Obviously at that time in 2016, the Falcons had Tevin Coleman and Devontae Freeman. The, the 49ers have three running backs, Brita, Mozart, and Coleman. Now, obviously, the 49ers don't have a receiver like Julio Jones, but Emmanuel Sanders is not to be laughed at or, or, or to be slept on. He is one of the better receivers in the league with a lot of young receivers around him, which you could kind of say the Falcons did. I mean, when, when Sanu was still young at that point, plus they had Ty- Taylor Gabriel and Aldrick Robinson, two young wide receivers also coming up a part of that explosive passing attack. Now, this is the only difference between the 49ers offense now and the Falcons the offense then. George, they did, the Falcons did not have a George Kittle. I think their top tight end that season was Jack, Jacob Tammy, which is a good serviceable tight end, but he's not like an elite tight end like George Kittle. And I feel like, you know, you can make your own decision if you think Garoppolo is better than Ryan or Ryan's better than Garoppolo. But the offense is pretty much similar. Very explosive and can beat you in all facets. And then obviously the 49ers defensively, this is something that has been happening over years. Even through the years of mediocrity, they have been building that defensive line with first round pick after first round pick after first round pick. They have added Bosa, Buckner, Solomon Thomas was remember, supposed to be one of the best defensive tackles since the Dayamakan Sue to come out, and he's fifth in the rotation. 
but he's still a dominant player. You know, D Ford. Like, they have a lot of talent up there. And they can dominate you and overwhelm you on your offensive line if your offensive line is weak. When they played the Packers last time, that's basically why they were able to basically beat down the Packers. Because they overwhelmed them on the line of scrimmage on both sides of the ball. And the Packers were just not ready for that. That's why a lot of people feel like the Packers are a finesse team. They're not a physical team. They're a finesse team because when they played against a real physical team like the 49ers can be, they did not have a good showing. So a lot of people wonder and question, Are can the Packers actually compete against the physicality and the talent of 49ers? The 49ers also got healthy. And I think this was the worst time for the Packers because they just got D4 back. And they just got Kawhi and Alexander back, one of their star linebackers. You basically got two star players back in the last game. And you saw how good they looked. Now they're going against a Green Bay team who is relatively, for the most part, healthy, but you just wonder if, are they going to be able to muster up better than they did last time? Going to Candlestick, going to the 49ers, can they can they, can they they do what they got to do to beat them on their home field? I think Rodgers is going to have to have one of his best games of the year. Devontae Adams is going to have to have one of his best games of the year. But they very much importantly, which Aaron Rodgers, remember, had never really had under Mike McCarthy is a running game. Of Aaron Jones, they need to be able to control the clock. You know, if the 49ers are going to run the ball, then we can run the ball too. You kind of got to match fire with fire a little bit here. So if I'm the Packers, I want to come in with a run first approach. If you come in with a run first approach, then you can keep them off the field. And then listen, some people don't feel like the Packers defense can handle that offense, but... If the two Smiths can come in there and dominate, they have a chance in this game. And if they can hold in on the back end. Because like I said, the receivers of the 49ers are not dominant. Where it's like there's that guy who's just, he can blow the game open. So you don't necessarily have to double team anybody. If anything, you got to double team George Kittle. But outside of that, you're going against pretty good receivers. But nobody that you feel like, oh, we got to shift our coverage to. So the Packers have to play good man-to-man and good run defense. And the 49ers just got to keep pounding the ball. They have to pound it with the three running backs. Garoppolo makes good decisions not making and doesn't make any mistakes. And you would feel pretty confident about the, the 49ers winning this game and beating Green Bay Packers and going on to the Super Bowl. You know, Kyle Shanahan's probably going to have the game plan ready. That defense is going to be ready. You know, Richard Sherman's man in that back end. So him going against Devontae Adams is going to be a big matchup. Because if he can handle Devontae Adams, which is the most reliable and most trusted receiver that Aaron Rodgers has, it could potentially be a long day for the Green Bay Packers. Now, if you're talking about on the Packers side of things, like I said, you have Aaron Jones. You have a, a, a prime running game. So it's not like it all has to be on Aaron. See, before it was all on Aaron. Aaron, Aaron, Aaron. If Aaron doesn't have a good game, they're losing. Now, Aaron can have a, have an average game or a decent game, but, and still be able to pull out with a victory or have be close late. Which then you would feel like, hey, Aaron Rodgers is still a superstar quarterback. We can trust him in late game situations, even against the 49ers defense. I feel like that if you're the Packers, you want to keep this game close going into the fourth quarter. You don't want this to get too overwhelming for you. You, you want to keep the game manageable. And you just want to play all your assignments right and play good, disciplined, mistake-free football. If you do that, you have all the potential in the world to beat the 49ers. Because listen, you saw it when the Vikings faced the Saints. The Vikings played mistake-free football. Their defensive line dominated the Saints offensive line, which then slowed down the Saints offense, which caused them to pick up the victory. And that's why I say it's very important that the two Smiths wreck this game. If they can wreck this game and make things difficult on the 49ers, it at least gives the Packers a chance to slow them down offensively. It does. It really does. So they're going to have to wreck the game or at least influence it as much as they can. And the Packers just have to hold up on the back end against these receivers. Again, that's what I'm saying. They're not going against the most elite receivers in the world. It's not like you're going against Julio Jones, so you know you have to switch coverage. You can man up everybody if you want, and you just got to hope they can they can deal with the 49ers receivers. And then obviously, you know, listen, 
Aaron Rodgers has been in this situation before. If it gets close, Aaron Rodgers needs to be able to come out there and lead them down the field to get a victory because that's what he's there for. That's what he is known for. You know, everybody, obviously in quarterback matchup, prefers Rodgers because he's the veteran here. He's the superstar. He's the proven guy. You know, because no, because if you don't look at talent, the Packers have the better forty not better quarterback in a lot of people's opinions. So clearly, if you if you're one of those people, you feel like if they keep the game close, Rodgers can win it. And 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 the Forty ers obviously, we've seen how they've been in close games more than more than likely than not, except the big Seattle game, and the Baltimore game, and the Bills game. They were able to come out and and, and win. Those games. But in the oh, those other games, Falcons game is a big one, the last one really. In clutch situations, they are also prone to lose, but it helps because they have experience. They have experience, they've been in those games. So both of these teams are battle tested. Both of these teams have been through the ringer of the league. You know, like I said, people may feel like the Packers have not been that impressive, but hey, you know, they're here. And they're one game away from the Super Bowl. And all they got to do is play the best game of the season potentially here. And you just sit there and think, why why wouldn't they be able to beat the San Francisco 49ers? But obviously San Francisco, if they do what they do best and they do it effectively, they should be able to take home the victory here. But coming up next, Bleacher Report released a list about a few players that our big name that could be gone or switch teams next year. I'll talk about that list and my thoughts coming up next. Check out the show that's built on the MMA from the UFC to extreme cage fighting. They got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G- GSMCpodcast.com for more info. SMC football podcast last segment we broke down the NFC side the NFC championship game between the 49ers and the Packers I gave you my thoughts and opinions on what both sides need to do and how they've gotten to this point so they can hopefully maybe continue the season for one of these two teams but we're obviously expecting a great game out of this today of these two on Sunday hopefully better than the first encounter that's for sure so now I'm going to go into a list that Bleacher Report released talking about eight players who could potentially be cut this year. So these players and teams, I mean, these players could potentially need new teams. And I'm going to break down players on this list and to give my thoughts and opinions on if I agree or not and where maybe I think they could potentially go down the line. So first person they have on this list is quarterback of the Cincinnati Bengals, Andy Dalton. Now, obviously, we feel like this is an an inevitable one. Obviously, every indication points to the Cincinnati Bengals drafting Joe Burrow from LSU. And they'll go ahead, honestly, and just give him the keys to the castle from day one. So, Andy Dalton is very extendable. Now, Danny Dalton, regardless of what you think of him, is a very serviceable quarterback. He can play. He's not a guy who's going to come in there and lose you games. Because remember, this man made playoffs, I think, four or five straight years to start his career. He can play. It's just usually in the big games is where you question if Andy Dalton can play. You question if he can get you there. But he would be a great bridge quarterback, in my opinion, in terms of if you have a young guy you want to develop. I think Andy Dalton would be a great selection for any team who may want to do that, potentially. If you know, obviously there was some uh, rumors that maybe New England could be interested if Brady leaves, because you know there's some thought that maybe Belichick doesn't want Brady anymore. 
So obviously that's obviously there's potential there for that to potentially happen. Um, obviously I think Andy Dalton could go other places. And I mean, honestly, the reason why Andy Dalton could get good is even though he has a year on his deal, there is no guaranteed money left for Andy Dalton. So pretty much Andy Dalton is, is probably going to be very, very much extendable. Now I wouldn't be surprised if Cincinnati maybe tries to get a trade for him to see if they can get something back. Because obviously you sometimes want to explore that just to make sure, like, hey, is anybody wanting to trade? But once it's out that you're probably going to let them go anyway, I feel like some teams might just go ahead and just wait for you to let them go. It just depends. Maybe you can trick a team into thinking somebody might make a move, so they might try to make a move. But I think that Andy Dalton, I think, is definitely an inevitable one. You know, he's he's pretty much uh, lived out his stay in Cincinnati. And you never know. Maybe next year he can have a Ryan Tannehill story. Go with a team who needs a quarterback, backup quarterback, whatever, and maybe the team does better than expected when he comes in there because of an injury or they give him the starting job, and maybe he can have a little run himself and be in a very uh, Cinderella-ish like run like the Tennessee Titans are looking right now. Next player on this list is the safety from the Baltimore Ravens, Tony Jefferson. Now, obviously, Tony Jefferson is, has a Pro Bowl, has helped Pro Bowl potential and play, Pro Bowl playing ability. Now, this year, you really weren't able to see that because after about five games he tore his ACL so obviously we wish him a very speedy recovery but Tony Jefferson has been one of the safeties who has always played well he joined the Ravens in 2017 he's been a mainstay and listen the defense was still good without him so it could make him very extendable obviously in his final year coming up now if they, the Ravens cut it Jefferson it would save them seven million in cap space now, keep in mind, Baltimore also has a lot of money in cap space, so it's not like it, unless they have big moves they want to make, it's not like they have to make this move, but it could be valuable to them. Obviously, I feel like Tony Jefferson, if he is cut, obviously, you know, you're getting a player coming off a major injury like the ACL, so you want to make sure he can still play. And sometimes, like they say, players don't go back to their full self until after a year after the injury, so we'll have to see which team may be willing to take a flyer on Tony Jefferson. But if you do and he plays well, you got yourself a starting quality safety. And listen, I'm sure a team would love to be able to get one of those types of guys. So I think Tony Jefferson, to me, I think Baltimore will go ahead and pull the trigger on him. I think they will release him. But it won't be a quick release. I think it'll be, we'll see what's out there. We see what free agency looks like. We'll look at the draft and we'll see, do we feel like it's better just letting him go or starting over and starting over at the safety position or keeping him around. Next uh, player on this list is Janoran Jenkins, cornerback for the New Orleans Saints. Now, obviously, if you know this story, George Jenkins was released by the New York Giants for an interrogatory term towards a fan and they cut him. The Saints picked him up to help with the playoff run to give him a very good second corner, obviously because some people are very questionable about Eli Apple. But when they the Saints picked him up, they inherited his $11.25 million 2020 salary. So he would be under contract for next year. So now the perception is that it doesn't mean that the Saints will cut him, but it's more likely because if they do cut him, They'll save eleven million, and they won't take a cap hit. So, unless maybe maybe he can get a pay cut or something, there's a very strong possibility that Jernoris Jenkins will be out of there. And I was like, remember, Jernoris Jenkins is a starting caliber set corner. So, if you needed a corner this off season and you want to take a flyer on Jernoris Jenkins, it would not be a bad idea because we know he can still play. And you know, the Jack Rabbit, as as they call him. You know, if you're a cor- if you're a corner corner needing team, I definitely will look into it. I definitely try to pick him up because I mean, what's the worst you can do? You know, it's hard to find good corners nowadays in the league. It is, you know, because the receive these passing games are so good that you need a guy who you know can can play against these guys. Yeah, you can take flyers on young guys out of college, but they're gonna have their growing pains, and maybe you can have a veteran like Janoris Jenkins come in and teach them. Just something for food of thought. The next player on this list is from the New York Giants, Nate Stoder, offensive tackle. Now, obviously, Nate Stoder, the reason why he may be gut is more for production purposes. He was responsible for 11 sacks given up in this past year. He did not play that well 
and also they the Giants can save six point five million in cap space this season if they do decide to cut him. Now, obviously, you this is something that obviously he was a mainstay in New England as an offensive tackle, left to get more money, hasn't played well. Is he broken down? Is something wrong? We don't know. I mean, at this rate, even though he didn't play the well the best in New York, he is still a serviceable tackle. He may not get big tackle money like he did, but he's very serviceable. And I think that you definitely should look into getting Nate Solder if you need some depth at the offensive tackle. And maybe you, you even use him as a starter, maybe for a one-year rental. I think Nate Soder would be a great addition to your team. I do think the Giants will cut him because of this. And listen, if you need you if you need to tackle, I think he, he he could be a guy to fill in for you for a year or two or be a great death tackle in terms of a backup. Next player on this list is Josh Norman, quarterback from the Washington Redskins. I feel like this is one that has been something that's going to probably happen. Josh Norman has not performed like he did in Carolina that year that went to the Super Bowl. He has been torched on multiple occasions by wide receivers in the league. And listen, the end of this season was not good for him. He was benched in November and inactive for three out of his last six games. So clearly, also with Ron Rivera, even though he did coach under him, might want to move on from him. Because he moved on from him then, even though obviously that may have been more of a money thing because obviously they didn't want to pay Josh Norman. But he may move on from him now because he's like, well, he's not that same guy who he was that year. And we don't want a liability who we're paying a lot of money to on the back end. Because if you're Washington, you're trying to fix the team, not hurt him. So I definitely feel like Josh Norman will be at a new team next year. If you can take a flyer on him if you think he can still play, but we'll have to see. Marcel Darius, Jacksonville Jaguars for the tackle is next on the list. I think that They'll make it because he he's a cap casualty. Jacksonville does not have that much cap room, and I think they need to release some make some cap room. Darius is only going to be thirty, so he has plenty of left in the tank, and I think he'd be a great addition for any team who needs a defensive tackle in the middle. And last player on this list, is Joe Flacco, quarterback for the Denver for the Denver Broncos. I think it's pretty much a done deal. He'll be cut. Drew Locke looks like he'll be the starting quarterback, and I feel like they need to go ahead and just release him, even though he'd have a lot of dead money in the books. You also need that cap freed up too. So I think that'd be just a great move for him just to go ahead and cut lot of losses with Joe Flacco because it's just not going to work out. Joe Flacco has run his course, and we'll have to see what happens next. But coming up next, we're going to talk about some news and notes around the league. We're going to talk about Luke Keekley, Larry Fitzgerald, and Antonio Dates here on the podcast. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts, past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. Welcome back to the GSMC Football Podcast. Last segment, we talked about a list that Bleacher Report dropped talking about eight players who could potentially be cut from their team this year because of cap casualties, production, injuries, maybe for the future. And I gave my thoughts and opinions on all of that. So now we're going to get into some news and notes around the league, really just more about players retiring or coming back. And we're going to start with the shocking news of Luke Keekley at the age of 29, I believe, retiring from the NFL early. Luke Keekley, if you didn't know, retired, releasing an, a video on his Twitter and on the Carolina Panthers website talking about his retirement. Now, obviously, Luke Keekley, you know, he's been one of the best linebackers since he's entered the league. 
He's been one of the best players to enter the league in a long time at that linebacker position. For the last almost decade, it feels like him and Bobby Wagner have been the top of the line middle linebackers in the NFL. This was shocking to a lot of people because of his age. Because you would feel like he would have more years to go. But if you don't know, Luke Kuechly has suffered through concussions. And obviously players are smarter, making more money early, and are taking more care of their health long term. And he, he even said in the video, if you watched it, I want to play, but I just don't know if that's a good idea. Because what if he gets another concussion? Now you don't know, third, fourth concussion, how, is that concussion going to be the one that maybe affects him in the future? You know, and I think that this is just a debate that's going to be brought up. Obviously, a lot of people retire early. Andrew Luck is a main example, retiring for the season this year. Dealing with injuries. Just, it, it wore him down. He mentally just couldn't do it anymore. You know, he's a guy that a lot of people feel like retired way too quick. Calvin Johnson, he was on a losing situation and he had injuries. Just felt like there's no point for me to keep playing to just keep losing and to keep hurting myself. You know, there's a lot of players that have retired early and just, you know, did it to protect their health. And you can't fault a player for that. You cannot blame this man. You should never say this man quit on anybody. He was just thinking about his life with his family and kids and to the future. And listen, Luke Keeley, Luke Keekley already might have entered himself into the Hall of Fame, what he's done. Like I said, he was one of the best middle linebackers in the NFL for years, almost literally since he came into the league. And all we can do is, is commend him for what he has done, respect his decision, and support him in his future endeavors. Now, obviously, sometimes we think about would these players ever sometimes after taking a couple years off, you know, getting that that hurt and pain off their body, would they consider coming back? I feel like in Luke Keekley's case, no, because if it's a concussion thing, it doesn't matter if you take two years off, five years off, ten years off. You still have those concussions. And that next concussion still could mess you up. If it's a situation maybe like Andrew Luck where he was just wore down by injuries, maybe because, oh, maybe he just needs to get his body feeling better and then he'll become back. But I feel like that's pretty much a done deal. I don't think Luck is coming back. I don't think Keekly is coming back. You know, I mean, listen, if he came back, that'd be great. But I think he he made this decision knowing if I do this, I can't just back out of it after like a month or two. I'm sure he'll miss the game. Who would miss this great game of football? Millions and pe- millions of people watch it. Millions of people love it. You, you, you would feel like, you know, you would do anything for this game. You know, people make the argument, oh, they make too much money. It's a part of the game. You're making all this money. Why not make more money? Just think about the money. But sometimes it's just not about the money. This man has probably already made enough money to live his entire life without working another job. But here's the thing. Obviously, Luke Keeley is not going to be a stay-at-home dad. He could probably be like a lot of these sports guys after they retire and get something and maybe broadcasting. That's still bringing home a paycheck. And he's still surrounded by the game he loves, which is football. So I always like to commend Luke Keekly for everything he's done. He has been a force in the NFL. He has been a force against my Falcons. He's been a force against every player, every offensive line, every running back, every party he's ever covered. And we only wish him the best because, you know... You, you, you see a man care about his future, you can't hate him for that. And now we're going to talk about a man who's coming back for another year, his 17th season, Larry Fitzgerald. Now, Larry Fitzgerald, you know, there's been some questions the last few years if he kept, he would keep coming back. And this year, he announced on Twitter he will come back for his 17th year. Now, there was an interesting stat full that was, that was out today, I read, that if he stayed and he got 86 catches per year for the next two years... He would break Jerry Rice's record for the most career receptions by one. Now, I don't know if that's something that he looks at. And I don't know if people look at Larry Fitzgerald as a high volume receiver at this point in his career, even though he did have 60 catches this year. I think he's a great mentor for the receivers with the Arizona Cardinals. I think he's a great mentor for Kyler Murray. Because listen, Larry Fitzgerald has never been a speed guy. He's always been a guy who could jump, 
who could run routes and has some of the best hands in the NFL. And he's reliable. He's almost like Anquan Bolden late in his career as, as well. Just reliable. Isn't going to break away just someone that you know can get you the first down, can get you that goal line touchdown. You know, Larry Fitzgerald has been such a legend in this game. Probably will be a first ballot Hall of Famer. Has been one of the most underrated number one receivers we've ever seen in this league. Larry Fitz is definitely one of the best receivers, in my opinion, to ever place up some cleats. And I, I'm glad that he's coming back for another year so people can still be blessed with him. Because like I said, you never know what year could be his last year. So you, this could be his last year. So make sure you you really take in and embrace everything that you have seen from Larry Fitzgerald. Because you don't know if this will be his last hurrah. You don't know. But I promise, everybody's going to soak in him being around. They're going to soak in what he does. Because that's what Larry Fitzgerald is. He's a great man. Great dad. One of the best NFL receivers. Probably the best NFL wide receiver in Arizona Cardinals history. Has all the accolades, has all the money. You know? He's continuing to play because of his love of the game. And with that love of the game, you know, that guy can drive you for a couple more years. It's funny because you got a lot of guys retiring early, but you got a lot of guys playing old, like Drew Brees in 42. Tom Brady's about to be 43. So it's kind of a mixed bag, you know, in terms of retiring early, but there's a lot of also a lot of players who are retiring late. Obviously, with all this sports medicine and the improvements in the game, it makes people be able to have longevity. But also, this is still a heart-hurting game, which in Luke Hickley's say is was seen. That's why he retired early. And now we're going to talk about a guy who's retiring just because he just feels like it's time to go. Antonio Gates, one of the greatest tight ends to ever play this game. Probably another first ballot Hall of Famer, in my opinion. Second ballot, at the least. He's a guy who's been Mr. Reliable in San Diego his whole career. He has basically been there with Phillip Rivers since day one. I want to say they were actually drafted in the same draft class, but I'm not 100% sure. But they've been together th- his whole career. You know, he's been Mr. Reliable. He's been one of the best tight ends to ever play this game. And, you know, he's had a long career. He's played well. Obviously, later end of his career, Hyundai drafted Hunter Henry to be his successor. Hunter Henry is one of the better tight ends in the league, but he's still been able to play with them because you know he's a great leader, he's a great mentor, and he's a great second tight end for any team that you wanted to be on there and have Derek Antonio Gates. He'll teach you how to play. He'll teach you how to be a great player. He'll teach you how to be a man, and he'll teach you how to do it right. Antonio Gates is one of the best guys, I think, just in terms of his humbleness. Just like Phillip Rivers, he never won anything major, like a Super Bowl. Went to countless Pro Bowls. All pro teams. But we're going to just remember him for everything he's done for the Chargers in San Diego. He will always be loved. He will always be cherished there. And we should love and cherish him too. Because he's one of our greatest players leaving the game. He gave all he could. He played for a very long time. You were blessed to be able to see him on your TV screen for years. And now he's calling it quits, and I wish him nothing but the best in the next stage of his life. But coming up next, we're going to talk about the fallout of the college football playoff uh, when LSU defeated the Clemson Tigers on Monday night to become your national championship champions of college football. Coming up right here. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to build that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play.
Welcome back to the GSMC Football Podcast. Last segment, we talked about Luke Keekley retiring suddenly, why he's retiring and wishing him the best. We talked about Larry Fitzgerald coming back for his 17th year. And we also talked about Antonio Gates and the great career he's had as he's also calling it quits after many, many, many years as the San Diego Chargers tight end. Now we're going to get into some college football. and We're obviously going to talk about the college football playoff national championship as the college football season has concluded. LSU defeats Clemson in, in, in a game where Joe Burrow really showed out and really solidified himself as the number one overall draft pick. Completely outplayed Trevor Lawrence, who did not have his best game. And, you know, this game was just... This game was just one of his signature games ever. You know, the, the debate is now, was this the greatest college football season that we've ever seen by a player? Responsible for 60-plus touchdowns, breaking almost every record in bowl games, playoff games, season. Joe Burrow just was unstoppable this year. They went against seven top 10 teams, I believe, or top 25 teams, and beat them all. You know? Coach A, Coach O said he knew he had a team when they converted, I believe, third and 18 or third and 23 against the, Tex, the Texas Longhorns in Austin. You know, LSU has been such a dominant team this entire year. The closest team to beating them all year technically was Alabama. Which, I mean, I've seen Alabama fans on social media crying that. They should have had a second chance. They would have beaten them. And, 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 and they, and they, and they're just as good, if not better. And then also when the Clemson lost, oh, Trevor Lawrence is overrated. And I'm just like, listen, regardless of what you think, Trevor Lawrence did destroy you last year in the national championship game. This is really what you could say one of his first really bad games in a big game that he's ever had. Two has had like two or three of those. So let's not sit here and act like he's been just perfect. It feels like Alabama fans, when they don't make the national championship, they kind of complain about every other team like we can beat every other team. No other team deserved it than us. And I say to them, beat Auburn. If you would have beat Auburn, you probably would have made it into the fourth spot. But you didn't beat Auburn. Auburn beat you. If Auburn beat you, then I'm, I mean, I guess it's safe for me to say Auburn's better than you. But going back to LSU, you know, LSU's just been dominant all year. They beat Georgia, Auburn, Alabama, Texas A&M when they were ranked, Texas, Oklahoma, Clemson. That That's not, that's not a bad list. Three of those teams were stopped, 20 scoring defenses. Joe Burrow beat them all. He beat them all flawlessly. He played his best football in the playoff. Some people still wonder if he's going to be that good on the pro level because he really only had one year of explosiveness, which was this year. But you can't take away what he's done, and he may go down as one of the greatest. Of not the, He won't go down as the greatest ever, but he'll go down as one of the greatest football players to ever play college football. I mean, at this rate, you might as well say he's the greatest quarterback to ever play at LSU. Honestly, it felt like everything was written for LSU this year, knowing that the national championship game was in New Orleans, and LSU's having their best year, and winning the national championship in New Orleans. You know, New Orleans, you know, ever since that Saints Super Bowl really hasn't had much. The Saints have given them disappointment after disappointment yearly, heartbreaking losses. The Pelicans have not been relevant in years. Even when they were the the Hornets, they weren't relevant. I mean, a little bit with Chris Paul, but in terms of championship relevant. And those are really the main two teams they have there in terms of professional. And they have done nothing to give this city what they want ever since that same championship. So this was big for the Louisiana to, to have this championship, to have the celebration of Joe Burrow and the LSU Tigers. Coach O is, is, is a heck of a coach. He's a heck of a motivator. You may struggle to understand him sometimes, but it don't matter if it just sounds like he's saying blah, 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 blah. I'm be ready to hit a wall for him because, you know, he loves it and he's perfect for LSU. He embodies what Louisiana is. 
That's why it works for him. That's why it's worked when he's been at LSU. Because he's embodied everything that they stand for there. And all you could do is give him credit for everything he has done. He's came in. He's been prepared. He got great coaches. And and, 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 and it paid off. Now, obviously, next year, LSU is losing a lot of talent. They're losing their top receiver, top quarterback, top running back. Boss might leave. They're losing a lot of guys. They lost his top safety. But listen, LSU has, for years, always recruited like Alabama. Always had the talent like Alabama. That's why those are always considered the, best, the biggest games on their schedule. It's just LSU never had that quarterback. Never had a quarterback that was good enough to beat them. This year, they finally had that guy. And now you see what that ends up in, a national championship for them and the city of Louisiana. Now, we don't want to take away any credit from the, the Clemson Tigers. They had a great season. A lot of people called them out because they felt they didn't play anybody. Then they finally played a good team in Ohio State. A lot of people considered, even at, before LSU, the most complete team. And they beat them. They came back. After being down 60 nothing. they came back. Clemson had a lot of talent. Trevor Lawrence played well. But he just didn't have it this game. He was overthrowing a lot of guys. He, he, he was, he was just struggling. The receivers were struggling to get off the press coverage that LSU corners were putting on them. You know, there was, there was just a lot of, you know, just a lot of, uh, there wasn't a rhythm with the offense in this game. And, and it showed. And I don't like to say, I don't feel like this is something that you look down upon if you're a Clemson fan. You know, Dabo's always said it's the world against Clemson. People feel like Clemson didn't deserve to be in the playoff. They deserved it. But LSU was just a better team this year. But let's not forget something. Clemson will be right back next year. I think, I mean, because you look at the ACC right now, and you just think realistically there's no talent on the team. I mean, on the teams that you think could scare Clemson next year. Trevor Lawrence has come back for probably his final year in college football. You know, you're still going to have Justin Ross. You're still going to have a lot of the talent that you've had the last few years. Obviously, you're going to have some guys go to the draft, but they're at that point where they're at Alabama where they reload. And Clemson will be right back where it is. Obviously, I think this loss could be potentially good for Trevor Lawrence because it's a humbling loss. But at the same time, this loss could provide him with motivation. Sometimes players lose and they're motivated because they don't ever want to lose again. And don't be surprised if Trevor Lawrence takes this loss and he's motivated to be better, to not have another performance like he had in another big game like the National Championship. These types of losses drive you. Sometimes you need that adversity as a, as a, as a team and as a, as a quarterback to really lead your team forward. Everybody who's coming back next year is going to remember this loss and say, not again. Not again. And that's completely okay. Because Dabo Sweeney is going to have these boys coached up. He's going to have these players ready. And he's going to have them ready to win a championship next year. Obviously, you know they're going to try to take care of business in the ACC. Make sure no slip-ups happen. And you know every year there's always going to be that game or two that might be a slip-up for you. But they're going to handle business. And whoever the other three teams that come out in those other playoff spots or other four teams that potentially could be battling for the four playoff spots, they're going to probably have just as good of a resume as anybody else against any of those guys. Because, like I said, Dabo always has them ready. He always has them ready to go. And he always has them ready to, to compete at a, at, a, at a high level. And like I, and so don't, don't, don't ever forget that they'll be back. They'll be back. I, I truly believe Clemson will be back, and there's absolutely nothing to worry about. Absolutely nothing to worry about. Coming up next, I'm going to give you my predictions on the AFC and NFC Championship games. Also, I'm going to give you some X-Factors in those games and why I think they could be X-Factors in both of those games. Coming up right here. 
This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. Welcome back to the GSMC Football Podcast. Last segment, we talked about the follow-up of the college football playoff. Joe Burrow having the one of the greatest seasons that by a college football player ever. Also, Trevor Lawrence bouncing back next year. And Clemson still going to be one of the top teams in college football next year, in my opinion. As they have reached Alabama status, as they always reload, never rebuild. And now we're going to go back into the championship games. And I'm going to give you my predictions and X factors in my game. Now, first, I'll start with the X factor for both teams, then give my prediction on the game. Go start with the AFC game. So, for the Kansas City Chiefs, obviously, we know Tyreek Hill and Travis Kelsey are the two main targets. Patrick Mahomes is a star quarterback. But my X factor in this game is going to be Damian Williams. Damian Williams is a guy who. He, he, he's been such a great addition to this team coming out of the backfield. He is so dangerous in the passing game, but also can be very dangerous on the ground, as saw in week 17 against the Chargers, scoring about a lot of three touchdowns that game on the ground. He's going to have to really test that second, that linebacker core for the Tennessee Titans, because if, like I said, you're the Titans, you're not really defending the run, you're defending the pass. So it's going to be very important that sometimes the Chiefs maybe hit them with a couple of draws and some running plays, keep the linebackers honest, make them be like, okay, we still got to defend the run, because if we don't, Damon Williams has showed the capability of being able to break a long one. So you don't want to sit there and just... Think, okay, focus on the receivers, that's it. Because, I mean, listen, Kansas City's offense is one of the best offenses ever. You have to focus on everyone. There's really no one that you can just look at and say, okay, you don't have to focus on them. But the person who probably be forgotten the most will be Damian Williams. And that's why he is my X factor in this game. Because if Damian Williams has a big game, I feel like there's no way Tennessee can win this game. Because if Damian Williams is making your linebackers look silly, then you don't have any linebacker help, really. You don't really want to use any safeties because Travis Kelsey has to deal with them, and you have to put your safeties on him. So the linebackers for the Tennessee Titans really have to be on their game against Damian Williams because he could have a big game if they try to uh, double-team the other guys and leave him one-on-one in matchups. For the Titans, obviously we know Derrick Henry is is the big target here on the offense of Tennessee. Obviously, we know Tennessee's defense plays very sound defense. But my X factor in this game is going to be Ryan Tannehill. This will be the first game I think this playoffs. He has to throw for more than 80 yards. He has, he has to throw and score some points through the air, which he's done. It's not like he hasn't. But he's going to have to do it more efficiently And he's going to have to do it with the intent that we have to keep scoring. If you get a lead on the Chiefs, I always say their team, you kind of just got to keep scoring. You can't get comfortable. So he's going to have to make some crucial throws, some clutch throws, some big plays off play action. And if he does it, then it's going to be very hard for the Titans to come out of this game with a victory. Because I think the Kansas City Chiefs is probably... Listen, if Derrick Henry has a big game, that definitely helps. But, you know, going against an offense like this, you're going to have to score some points, which means you're going to have to get some air offense in there. The Tennessee Titans have been lucky because their def- the running game's been great, but defensively they've held teams below 13 points. 
So really, you didn't have to throw it out and air it out because it's not like, oh, we are in a high-scoring shootout. This could potentially be a shootout like it was the last time they played. Tannehill had two touchdowns in that game. He played very well in that game. He's going to have to play very well in this game. So if you're looking for a prediction, I do think the Kansas City Chiefs are one of the most unstoppable teams right now, and I think they're going to go to the Super Bowl. But there is a part of me that kind of wants Tennessee to win for the Ryan Tannehill story and just the Cinderella story of Tennessee not even thinking there's people thinking they're even supposed to be there. Now making it to the Super Bowl in Miami where Ryan Tannehill used to play just last year and now having the opportunity to potentially celebrate with the Lombardi Trophy on their field. I wouldn't say he would feel like it it was revenge, but... It will definitely make you feel good. And and, and I'll, listen, Ryan Tannehill is going to get paid this offseason. Because that's just what you do. If a quarterback gets to the Super Bowl, you pay him. That's just as simple as it gets. Because he technically did what not everybody can do. So why wouldn't you pay him? Regardless of what you really think he is. Like if Mr. Bisky won the Super Bowl, you're going to pay him. He won the Super Bowl. Because remember, Phil Rivers, you may say, is a better quarterback than Mr. Bisky, but he's never won a championship. So, but if Mr. Bisky won one, doesn't matter if we still think that that's the case. Mitch is getting paid. Now we're going to go to the NFC game. And I'm going to talk about my X-Factor for the 49ers. My X-Factor in this game is going to be Emmanuel Sanders. Because he was traded for this season for these types of games. He has to dominate his matchup on the perimeter and be very crucial in third downs. Because Emmanuel Sanders has always been a receiver who has had top receiver potential. And he may not be a number one, but he is a top number two receiver. And he has to make plays. If he makes a couple of plays, it'll soften up that Packer defense, which would now even open up the opportunities even more for Mozart and Brita and Tevin Coleman, Kittle. Because listen, passing wise, you'll probably shift your coverage towards Kittle. But if Emmanuel Sanders goes off, then that's going to obviously have to change because, you know, you have to think about if Emmanuel Sanders goes off, we can't put our coverage on Kittle. We have to put it on Emmanuel Sanders. And if that's the case, then that switch happens and, you know, 49ers offense is really unstoppable at that point. Now, on the Packers side of things, I think the X factor in this game is every receiver but Devontae Adams. They have to show up and play well. It can't just be Aaron Jones, Adams, and and, and 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 Rodgers, and that's it to beat the 49ers. Those other receivers have to make plays. When the ball is thrown to them, they need to make the catches, they need to make the plays, they need to make the first downs, they need to make the big play over the top, they need to score the touchdowns. Because if they don't get any production from those other receivers, there is no way I think that they can beat the 49ers. I just don't think, unless their defense, Packers defense, plays one of their best games of the year and makes it a low-scoring game, I don't see if this game gets into the high 20s and early low 30s, how they're going to be able to score enough points to be able to beat the the, the, the the 49ers. So the other receivers for the Green Bay Packers have to step up, have to, scantling. You know, he's going to have to make plays. Allison, he's going to have to make plays. Jimmy Graham has played a little better in the playoffs, and he's going to have to continue to make plays. Because you're going to need all hands on deck to beat a team like the 49ers. I think everybody knows that, because you just can't sit here and expect yourself to beat them straight up. The 49ers are the better overall roster, but the Packers have the best player on the field in Aaron Rodgers. And he has to show that, but he does need help. In my prediction in this game, I'm going to go with the 49ers. I think the 49ers are just going to be too much for the Green Bay Packers to handle. 
I think they're just they're they're clicking on all cylinders. They're healthy. That's the biggest thing. And I just think they're gonna go ahead and pick up the and pick up the win and, and advance to the Super Bowl for the first time since I believe 2013. So my Super Bowl matchup, my Super Bowl prediction will be Chiefs 49ers. Low key want it to be Titans 49ers. But thank you for listening to the GSMC Football Podcast here on the GSMC Podcast Network. Please remember to subscribe and leave a review. Also, follow us on social media on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you, and have a good day. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Football Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.